on urban space and inclusion and i'll be taking you through this webinar first of all i would like to thank everyone who's anxiously waiting for sir to talk on behalf of city speaks we are thankful to all our well wishers and friends for your constant support and to all those who are new to the organization we we try we are looking forward to make it everlasting friendship with you so we always look forward to extending the city speaks family and your newly provided support makes us really happy so let me take a moment to introduce city speaks to all those who are new to the organization city speaks is a young startup founded in 2019 in the field of urban research and civic management city speaks is driven by the desire of bridging the asymmetry in information pertaining to small cities in india city speaks rests a firm conviction in planning that is participatory governance that is resilient and urban spaces that are inclusive with its primary focus on small cities in india through its research city speaks aims to bring about contextually embedded policies that elicit participatory planning resilient governance and inclusive and sustainable cities to begin with i would request everyone from the audience to make sure that the video and audio are switched off except the speaker host and co-host only the videos of sir co-host and host will be switched on the session will be recorded and published on our website for future reference the topic for today's talk as you all know is the labor market in formal and informal sectors in small cities post the covid-19 shock as already evident the covid-19 pandemic and the pandemic induced lockdown have affected the socio economic condition of our country as we are sailing through one of the most adverse crises the world has ever seen we should also look at what lies ahead of us having seen the struggles of migrant laborers fleeing back to their homes to those under fear of loss of job from the organized sector we know the labor market is not going to be same post the shock reports say that the workers especially in the informal sector are at threat of falling into deeper poverty due to the crisis it's analyzed that the pandemic will have far reaching impacts in the labor markets of small cities especially and different institutions worldwide have been discussing the gravity of the situation to give us a deep insight on the situation and on what would the state of labor market be in the informal and formal sectors in small cities post the covid-19 shock we have the very respected professor anamitra rao choudhury with us thanks for joining us sir we would like to thank you for readily accepting our invitation with so much of warmth and for being a source of unflinching support from the very beginning of the planning of this webinar sir is currently an assistant professor in the center for informal sector and labor studies school of social sciences jawaharlal nehru university He has worked extensively on labor economics and is the author of many renowned articles on economics, including a very recent article, a personal favorite, titled "Labor Rights in Free Fall," published in the Hindu. But interesting observations in the on the present state of labor rights and laws. As is customary, City Speaks would love to delve into Sir's many achievements and endeavors. However, speaking of them briefly would be an understatement of his expertise. Hence, we leave that for you to read in the chat section. So now, as we move on to Sir's words, I also remind the audience to kindly keep your audio and video on off mode. Towards the end of the talk, there would be a question and answer session. The viewers can leave your questions on chat for Sir to answer. without any delay i'm taking you to the most awaited part of the webinar i would like to hand over the platform to you sir over to you sir thank you so much uh, uh, am i audible you can hear yes sir you are yes sir uh, okay both audio and video are clear okay uh, thank you very much city speak for arranging this talk and uh you know i'm delighted to be part of this uh, lecture series uh so the topic uh today what ambik told me to speak on is you know really vast because it uh, talks about the uh, you know labor market in informal and formal sector which is itself formal uh, segment of the labor market and informal segment of the labor market are often uh, segmented 
and then it talks about uh, you know post covid shock what's the uh, impact of post covid shock that too in the small cities so you know so there are many uh, issues which are related here so we, it's a it's a vast topic so let me see that how much i can uh, you know cover it in uh, the 45 to 50 minutes uh, and so on okay so <clears throat> In order to find out that what is happening in the labor market in the small cities post COVID shock, I think a, a logical entry point to this debate would be to start from uh, to have a reference point. And the reference point that I would be taking in order to, uh, you know, later on uh, conclude that what, what what are the impacts that we can see is that what is happening what was happening even before the shock so i i start from where it uh, i mean uh, even before the shock what was happening the second thing is that of uh, i start from the aggregate labor market now uh, why aggregate labor market because in so far as uh, modern economies are connected with each other in that case what is happening in the small cities cannot be completely uh, different from, I mean, it, it can't go in the opposite direction in what the aggregate labor market is, uh, the trends which the aggregate labor markets are showing. Therefore, I start from uh, aggregate labor market and before the shock in order to understand what is happening uh, to the labor market in the small cities post COVID shock. So, this is the picture of the aggregate labor market. Uh, I am told that there are people who are uh, from various disciplines, so I will uh, try to explain this a little bit in uh, detail. Uh, this is a very standard way of analyzing the labor market, which is to, uh, you know, uh, to, to analyze it from uh, demand side and the supply side. So first we look at it from the supply side. So entry into the labor market. So how, how do we analyze the entry in this labor market? How do we understand this? Is that, let us look for the, so this is a comparison between two uh, years. This survey is from the NSS. Uh, the NSS uh, two surveys which are taken is 2011, 12, and that of 17, 18, which is the uh, periodic labor force survey. So, uh, so what, what is this telling you is this uh, labor force uh, population ratio. Basically what this is telling you is that, so let us look at for rural male uh, for uh, that's the look, look concentrate on the, uh, you know, uh, blue bar, okay. Rural male, the blue bar, which is basically showing that 55.3%. These, these are all in percentages in, in uh, what, what happens to Part 100 uh, population. This is telling you is that rural male, part 100 rural male into uh, in 2011 12, 55.3 entered the labor market. They wanted jobs. This is what it is telling. That's basically the labor force population ratio. I hope it is clear. So what you can then and, and all these graphs are basically talk, you know, bars are telling you the same thing. And what you can find is that the green bar is of course for 2017-18, the most recent survey. What you find is that now look at if you compare the bar for rural male and rural female, what you would find that there is for rural male there is a marginal decline, for rural female, there is a sharp decline. And for rural urban male and urban female, there is, you know, not much change, but there is a, a you know, slight improvement, actually. Okay. Now, if you combine all these different segments of the population, now, uh, why do I show rural male, female, urban male, female? Is because this is a very standard way of analyzing the labor market. Uh, one of the things that why we analyze in this manner is that you can, 
you know, find that the stories in the rural male segment will be different from the rural female segment and so in the urban areas, okay? So how do you know that? Is that just look at the difference in ratios of participation that would make it clear why it is, uh, why uh, we analyze it separately. But suppose we take them together and uh, that's the last bar, which is the all bar, where you find that, now this is important, is that the proportion of people who wanted to join the labor market, who wanted to join the labor market between 2011, 12 and 17, 18, that came down by 2.4%, okay? 39.4, it came down to 37 point, 37%, okay? What you find in red in the uh, bracket is basically that this is the absolute number of people who are joining the labor market. Now, obviously the question arises is that if the proportion of uh, proportion is going down, how come is the number of people who, absolute number who are joining the labor market that's increasing, that's very simple, is that this proportion is applied on an underlying population. So if the underlying population is increasing, as you would, uh, you know, agree that between 2011, 12 and 17, 18, the underlying population increased, uh, your, uh, you know, even if the proportion was falling, nonetheless, because the underlying population was increasing, therefore, what you find is that the number of people who are joining the labor market, that increased. But note here is that this increase is not above average. Why do I claim that? It is because population growth was not increasing above average. Neither was the proportion increasing. Actually, it was falling. Therefore, what we conclude from this type is basically that labor supply was increasing, but this was not an above average increase in the labor supply. So what was happening to labor demand? That is, that is the absorption in labor market. This is, we, uh, you know, uh, estimate it through what is known as the work and population ratio. So, uh, so note that all those who will be willing to find a job or entering the labor market will not end up getting a job. Why? Because some people will be unemployed. So, uh, so this proportion is telling you of the, you know, that this is the proportion of people in population who ended up getting job, okay? Now, look for all segments, rural, male, female, urban, male, female, there is actually a decline, irrespective of the segment of population, there is a decline in the proportion of, uh, you know, people who ended up getting job, okay? Now look at the, then look at the, uh, you know, aggregate or what is the all, that's the last bar, last two bars. So in 2011, 12, 38.5% of population actually got job, which if you, uh, you know, apply it on the population, you would find that 472.5 million got job. Now, this is an important result, is that for 2017-18, actually it not only the proportion failed, the absolute number also failed. Now you can, you know, uh, find out the implication of this is that what this is showing is that aggregate employment, employment in the aggregate labor market was actually coming down, okay? So there's a negative growth of employment. This is again, something which, you know, all researchers have got this result. The magnitude varied, but the direction is, Clear is that there is a employment decline between 11, 12, and uh, 17, 18. Now note that uh, you know if you have this uh, decline in uh, so so what is the implication of that that labor demand is uh, turning negative? It's basically what does that mean? Is that employment growth was negative between these two uh, periods? Now, as a result of that, what we would find in the labor market is that unemployment rate, which is basically LS is labor supply, LD is labor demand. So if you take 
the difference between these two you will find that those people who uh, labor supply meaning those who entered the labor market in the hope of getting job labor demand is those who actually ended up getting a job the difference between these two is basically the number of people who are unemployed if you divide that uh, you know uh, through the labor supply what you get is the unemployment rate so in the last two slides we got the labor demand and labor supply therefore you can calculate the unemployment rate and you can find that for every segment of population unemployment rate actually increased okay so for rural male for example it the increase was almost threefold you can check for the other segments of population and for aggregate this is a very standard result i think you have uh, read in the newspapers and so on is that aggregate unemployment rate uh, was 45 years high it was 6.1 percent which is basically your green bar the rightmost green bar which is 6.1 percent and you can find out that it there was uh, you know almost uh, you know more than it more than doubled okay it was 2.5 percent it increased to uh, uh, 6.1 percent so in aggregate numbers the reserve army of labor or those who are looking for jobs actually increased by 20 million 11 million to 31 million uh, now why did that happen please uh, remember that it was not because labor supply was increasing something above average why this was happening is because labor demand uh, actually collapsed so the so the point from here is the following is that even before the lockdown or even before the pandemic hit us indian economy was not doing good in terms of employment i think it's you all also know that the growth rate for several quarters was falling even before the pandemic and it was in the range of uh, you know four percent four point five percent for several quarters it was it was falling so neither growth rate was doing good that you know from uh, media reports and so on data also shows that and your what this shows that even before the pandemic the labor market in terms of employment generation it actually turned negative not only uh, for the first time what you find is that uh, you know uh, open unemployment rate now this is very serious is that in a developing country normally you won't find that open unemployment rate is high okay why not is because simply people cannot afford to remain unemployed because there is no uh, you know unemployment uh, insurance that uh, you uh, can draw upon and therefore you know people uh, do uh, all kinds of jobs in order to you know some petty jobs in order to eke out a living so if you find that the uh, open unemployment rate is such high therefore there was a serious problem uh, in the uh, labor market even before uh, the uh, pandemic uh, hit us okay now turning to the, to the uh, uh, cities well of course these are not small cities these are you know million plus cities uh, and however what you find you know the logic of beginning from the aggregate labor market can be seen from here this is again from the periodic labor force survey what you find is that what you find in the aggregate labor market is actually reflected in these cities as well in a sense just uh, you know read the red line which basically is telling you is that of the 45 million plus cities uh, 18 cities only had unemployment rate which is less than the national uh, average unemployment Rate, that is 6.1 percent the rest of the 27 actually had unemployment rate more than the national average and if you look at these 11 cities they had double digit unemployment rate for example look at merat uh, you know elabad kanpur dhanbad and so on and so forth you would find that unemployment rate is not only double digit they are extremely high now uh, in a developing country as i was saying is that open unemployment rate you would uh, normally don't find and uh, you know if you still find that there is so many there are so many people who are uh, you know openly unemployed 
who are reporting themselves to be unemployed and not getting even petty jobs in that case that's a serious comment on the situation of the labor market uh, that we already find in 1718 one possible reason one can think about is that in 1718 this survey was done between uh, you know july to june july uh, 2017 to june 2018 and remember in november 2016 we had demonetization so it's possible that the labor market did not revive from uh, what happened uh, in november 2016 and, and we may be picking up trends from uh, i mean for example uh, in in 45 years from 1972 when uh, employment data was collected never we have seen that the unemployment rate uh, is so high so this this is the reason that and and you also know the reason that why it was it is so high is because the labor demand completely collapsed okay now as you would uh, expect that in a slack labor market where people are just uh, you know uh, uh, competing for jobs in that case the wage growth if it's not a tight labor market bargaining power of the workers are less and therefore your wage growth would be less which actually is the case what you find is that for regular wages real growth in wages turn negative okay. that you can find from both in rural and urban areas in the current period it turned negative as you can see for casual wages even uh, the Uh, growth rate in wages these these are growth rates growth rate in wages actually half so for example in rural areas for casual wages in the previous period 2004 to 11 growth rate was 6.7% it actually um, yeah, came down to 3.5% in the current period that's between 11 12 and 17 18 okay now so so this is the situation that we found in the aggregate labor market can we find out and this will have implications for the small cities is is, is that can we find something in terms of uh, the sectoral distribution of this employment now what we find is that the ma major reason for aggregate employment turning negative is because agriculture was actually shedding workers so you know it started even in the previous period that is between 4 to 11 it continued between 11 to 17 so it was negative earlier it is negative uh, in the current period however what saved the day uh, in the previous period is the non agriculture note that the increase in non agricultural employment in the previous period was uh, you know uh, 49 million around 49 million but that actually halved in the current period 25.9 million around say 26 million okay so the decline in employment in the previous period from agriculture was made up by somewhat made up by the increase in employment in the non agriculture sector this time around that did not happen and as a result what you find is that that negative total what you find for the uh, you know 11 to 17 is because uh is is because of uh, that uh, non agriculture there was no increase i mean the pace of employment growth actually halved between the two periods in non agriculture now what about the small cities is that one of the so for example census town one of the definition for census town is that uh, 75% of uh, male workforce actually is in non agricultural employment now note that if people are shedding if if people are moving out of agriculture automatically this has implications for uh, you know the number of census towns going up so the fall in farm employment what you find as uh, you you know the definition would actually then impact the uh, census towns and uh, so so uh, that's uh, important thing what, what you find from 2001 census to 2011 census that the number of census towns rapidly increased between these two periods the reason is that people were just leaving the farm sector okay 
what you also find is that this is again coming back to the aggregate is that manufacturing employment actually declined again it turned negative okay so around 1 million declined 0 0.9 uh, so you know so all this uh, despite these policies of making india um, and 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 so on it actually didn't result in uh, in in uh, in boosting the manufacturing neither manufacturing growth nor manufacturing employment as the data shows okay uh, this has implication for small cities again in so far as small cities are other than you know very few small cities where you would find uh, say acz industrial park there they, they would be locations for uh, low end manufacturing products and uh, in so and and, and uh, in in so far as it did not uh, it, it did not the manufacturing employment did not take off therefore employment in these uh, in these uh, small cities would also suffer in that way another important part is that of construction in these small cities okay now as you would expect that people who are living agriculture with uh, not uh, much education or uh, uh, skill skills they would actually uh, in the non agricultural sector would be absorbed uh, likely to be absorbed in the construction sector of course low end services but majorly in the construction sector now note that what happened to construction sector employment in the uh, between the two periods it is almost uh, you know uh, six times decline uh, 24 million in the earlier period sharply declined to it was positive so construction sector was still generating uh, employment but the pace of employment growth shrank from 24 million to that of uh, you know uh, 4.6 million in the current uh, in the current period okay so this sums up that so our first uh, section if you like of the uh, lecture is that uh, so we have formed a background as what was happening to the labor market even before the lockdown and then uh, i mean the covid shock which led to the lockdown and then in came the lockdown now with the lockdown what we would expect is that the labor market will completely vanish why because the lockdown is going to affect both your uh, supply side and demand side how it's going to apply uh, you know affect your uh, supply side uh, simple is that uh, by the way am, am i audible yes sir yes, yes yes sir yes okay so if if you find that uh, you know it's uh, it's breaking or something you have to tell me because i can't sure, see sure 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 so uh, so your uh, supply side is going to be affected very simply a by the following is that by the lockdown you do not allow the laborers to go out of the household so supply side vanishes demand side also vanishes is because you know the uh, farms or shops they are by law not allowed to operate so if they are not allowed to operate in that case uh, you know obviously uh, you, you, both sides are gone so this is a data from the center for monitoring indian economy cmi which also has data for rural sector uh, you can go and check but uh, i am only taking it from the urban uh, for the urban segment is that urban unemployment rate in march uh, remember it was uh, the lockdown was uh, announced at the end of last week of march so uh, the unemployment rate was high of course 9.35% but in april it you know it was astonishingly high it was you know more than doubled from already a high uh, unemployment rate it was 25 percent and if you check the data for may it has even increased higher one time it reached 27 percent in the beginning of may but currently it is also 26 percent okay so you can you can clearly see that the lockdown actually aggravated the problem and
and it also brought out a very ugly truth about uh, the Indian society is that large sections of the urban uh, workers barely earned subsistence. They had no savings to withstand the initially announced three weeks lockdown, which, uh, you know, which was extended. And this led to, we have all seen, this led to a distressed migration and people were, you know, just simply on the roads walking for thousands of miles in this, you know, in, in this tremendous heat without food, water, you know, horrible sights. I mean, it, it, bring, it brings back uh, memories of, uh, you know, pictures that we have shown, uh, seen about uh, uh, partition or you know say 1971 Bangladesh during the time of Bangladesh war and so on that you know thousands of people on uh, the road question is could this be uh, you know predicted beforehand it seems yes uh, now note that it would be reasonable to argue uh, to assume that you know those who were migrants and on the road they were daily wage laborers okay now although it is the case that those who are migrants and those who are on the road they were daily wage uh, laborers the opposite is not true in the sense that all daily wage laborers need not be migrants and need not be on the road for example suppose you do not you you have sold off all your land in the uh, village and therefore they, you have you, you, you there is no one that you can go back or fall back during the time of a crisis and therefore even if you are daily wage worker you are not on the road because you have nowhere to go so therefore the crisis that you know there is more crisis than what meets the eye that that's the point now the question is that could we have predicted this beforehand uh, so what I do here is I use the suicide data for, uh, you know, so it's, it's uh, common knowledge that uh, I think Sainath and others have written extensively about it. K. Nagraj has written extensively about it is that farmers is a, a segment who are, uh, you know, I mean, the, the distress in the agricultural sector is captured by the uh, you know suicides of uh, the farmers now uh, and 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 we know that from 1995 onwards almost uh, 3 lakh farmers have committed suicide so it's very well is that distress of the farm sector is captured by the uh, farmer suicide now what I have done here is that I have taken a ratio of now now from 2014 onwards, uh, NCRB, which is the National Crime Bureau record, actually started publishing data for uh, suicide figures for daily wage laborers. So I have calculated I have taken a simple ratio which is basically in the numerator you have suicides committed by daily wage workers in the denominator you have suicides committed by uh, farm sector i mean workers i mean uh, those who are uh, engaged in the farm sector that is cultivator plus agricultural labor what you find already in 2014 is that this ratio is more than 1 to be precise 1.27 so the number of uh, daily wage workers committing suicide was more than that of farm sector workers and shockingly all these years what you find is that this ratio is continuously increasing and for 2018 for every farm sector suicides there were almost three uh, daily wage workers who were committing suicides so therefore they were more vulnerable than the you know uh, than the uh, farm sector workers whom we know that they are vulnerable already from because agriculture is not doing good for some time now and therefore it was not difficult to predict that this is going to happen and uh, and it did happen i mean the pictures that we have seen actually confirms uh, this trend 
So therefore, this uh, 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 you know underscores the importance of uh, that uh, public distribution system, or uh, the, it was necessary that uh, immediately after the lockdown there was some kind of measure to uh, to 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 hold them back in the cities. It was necessary that uh, uh, food uh, was given to them, but it was not the food is not uh, enough because there are also importance of cash transfers is because you you have to pay rent so uh, think i mean uh, and also you have to buy uh, emergency medicines there are certain kinds of foods which are not uh, uh, given through the public distribution system for example baby food i mean uh, th these are not provided through uh, public distribution system and you have to buy these things from the market and therefore, uh, you know, and, and, and think of the following is that even if you have food, even if you have no problem of uh, having a small baby or medicine, the simple fact that you have to pay rents, uh, you know, and, and otherwise you would be evicted, you would have to cut the road and uh, because uh, you can't pay the rent because your uh, uh, employment is gone transfers were necessary and uh, you know this uh, the ministry of uh, home affairs actually uh, took out a notification and said that the uh, employers have to pay the wages and landlords in the same notification said that landlords uh, cannot ask for rent uh, during the period of lockdown and uh, you know, employers lobbied with the Supreme Court. Supreme Court brought out an uh, uh, order saying that uh, you can't force uh, people to pay wages. And the new uh, order, which has now come from the Ministry of Home Affairs, actually uh, has dropped. Uh, it has withdrawn this, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, saying that you have to, employers have to pay wages and the uh, rent uh, clause, both these clauses are now dropped. Okay, uh, what can we say more about that of uh, the labor market uh, in the lockdown period? Uh, what we can, uh, I mean, I draw upon a survey which is conducted by the uh, Center for Sustainable Employment by, by Ajin Penki University. This is not a random sample, therefore this is not representative. This is a partnership sample of 3,970 households during the period of lockdown. And what they compared is uh, they took a before after approach. So basically, you know, they, uh, you know, uh, they Asked, this, this was a phone interview. They asked people that in the month of February what they were doing. And I mean, the, the survey was conducted in uh, first week of May. They asked uh, people that what they were doing in terms of employment, whether they had a job or um, and, and how much they were earning in the month of February and what they were doing now, meaning in May. And it shockingly uh, shows that in May compared to March, we, so the, you know, for rural and urban areas taken together, 67% of those who were employed in the month of February lost employment in May. Okay. It's, 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 a, it's shockingly high now. Okay. In the urban areas, actually it goes up to 80%. So out of every 10 people who were working in the month of February, eight people lost jobs in uh, the month of May. Why would that be the case? Very simple, is that the state machinery will be able to enforce the lockdown much more efficiently in urban areas than compared to in the rural areas. And therefore you would find that large, more number of people would therefore, uh, you know, uh, do, uh, lose employment in the urban areas than compared to that of the uh, rural areas. What about earnings? Casual wage workers' weekly earning actually dropped by 50%. In the regular wage category, you know, uh, again 50% were either not paid or their salaries dropped. 
now look at the self employed in the uh, non agricultural uh, in 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 in, in non agriculture their weekly earnings actually dropped by 91% so it's completely kind of washed away who would be self employed in non agriculture for example barbers uh, you know uh, plumbers electricians and so on petty shop owners so obviously during the lockdown except for tremendous emergency you are not going to fall for a plumber so, or an electrician okay so so therefore uh, you know uh, so so therefore they completely lost out on earnings the other interesting fact that we find out is that farmers were also unable to uh, you know uh, uh, sell crops which uh, the survey shows is that of uh, 15% that uh, they could not sell crops and 37% could not even harvest okay so this last point that they could not even harvest has implications for small cities now we come to the third part of our uh, you know concentrating specifically on the small cities and what was happening to the small cities uh, you know unfortunately there is no survey which is specific to the small cities therefore i won't be able to present uh, uh, you know farm data on this but nonetheless we can uh, you know reasonably argue that what 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 what, what can be expected from the uh, you know impact of the lockdown in the small cities now in so far as harvesting is done through uh, migrant workers this is rural rural migration uh, yeah, you know uh, from say state of bihar up jharkhand for harvesting the standing rabi crop in punjab say because of the lockdown they could not go to this state for harvesting therefore harvesting gets delayed okay so this is a impact which, uh, which which is which is a direct impact that you will face uh, due to the lockdown specifically in the market towns or where the mandis are really uh, you know located you find that you know because of the lockdown because of social distancing and so on uh, th there will be not only labor shortages but and and you know in, in specifically the you know the nature of work in these mandis are labor intensive so you know say for example loading unloading and so on and so forth so if the lockdown is if you know is strictly imposed in that case what you would find is that these activities in the mandis are going to be negatively affected due to uh, uh, you know because of that now as a result of that because uh, the mandis are going to uh, you know because the harvesting is not going good in that case those industries which which has a forward linkage to this say for example food processing industries which are uh, uh, you know those which are located in the small cities they will also get negatively affected if you have a poor harvest in so far as the uh, msmes are linked through forward and backward linkage uh, with the large cities they are also going to be affected because this Uh, linkages with the large cities are broken because of this lockdown so uh, so this is another route through which activities in the small cities are going to get affected in, in so far as this is msmes are located in the small cities now we also know that the small cities not only uh, you know cater in form of uh, through the link of large cities only but they also have certain kind of uh, autonomy or resilience uh, and uh, because they use the local raw material inherited knowledge and often produce uh, goods which are low cost and specific to the demands of uh, you know people who are uh, in these uh, areas in these urban areas the people who are so they are producing low cost products so they won't be affected much directly with the lockdown however 
there is one way through which it can be uh, which through which it will be affected is in the following way in so far as the people from these small cities actually travel to the large cities in order to get their uh, employment but spend the money in the small cities and because these people cannot now go to the large cities in order to earn their uh, you know, livelihood they won't be able to spend purchasing power which is going to affect even those industries which are resilient to whatever is happening outside the periphery of these cities so uh, so that that that's a real uh, you know way through which it can get affected even even those uh, you know uh, farms which are uh, which are uh, using local raw material and so on and so forth there is another way through which it can happen which is the following is that those who have you know gone to the large cities and sent back money in form of remittance to these small cities the market actually is in the small cities because the remittance money is spent in the small cities in so far as the remittance dries up this is also going to affect the uh, purchasing power in the uh, small cities the other way through which the and if, if the demand is gone in that case nobody is going to employ people who were producing these products and therefore jobs will also be lost in that way there is another way through which these small cities are going to get affected it's the following think of the following is that because of the loss of employment in the uh, large metropolitan cities people went back to the uh, the rural areas which are again uh, you know uh, not far from these some of these small cities so what you would find an uh, excess supply of labor or a slack labor market in the rural areas in so far as people migrated from the small cities you will also find that there will be a slack labor market in the small cities because people will be then returning back to their uh, you know uh, villages and so on and and to the extent they go back to the small cities but this is not only a short term thing because i think there are media reports which are now telling is that different migrants are telling that uh, you know we will leave on salt we will not go back to the large cities because of the harsh treatment that they got in uh, at the time of the lockdown uh, i do not know whether that is going to happen probably you know they have to come back because of the push factors of migration and because the employment opportunities in the small cities and in the rural areas are just not there enough so therefore uh, you know probably they will come back but let us keep that aside now think of the following is that in so far as they do not want to come back to the rural uh, uh, population they do not want to come back to the large cities but nonetheless do not also want to stay in the rural areas some part, some of them will actually migrate to the small cities therefore slack labor market is not only in the short term it's going to continue for some time so in the mid term also you will find this kind of a situation prevailing in the small cities finally therefore what kind of policy can one think of is that what is immediately therefore required is that revamp the public distribution system distribute food and cash transfer is the need of the hour the other thing which is you know very much essential is to uh, provide people with not only with cash and food but also in the uh, you know in the, in 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 the uh, in, in, in uh, immediately to provide them with some kind of employment therefore extension of, of uh, employment guarantee scheme something like mtnrega uh, to be extended to the urban areas the other thing i think it's necessary that Uh, what happens to the small town is not only the policy what happens in the rural areas will determine it in the following way not only through uh, in, in terms of labor migration but also 
in so far as the small towns are important service centers for the rural population so so these are markets of, uh, uh, also for the uh, uh, rural economy i mean the pro product produce of the small cities are actually a large part of it also is also sold in the rural economy therefore revival of the rural economy is uh, important the other thing is that of uh, you know the, so so first two points are immediate uh, actually first three points are immediate and in the mid term to long term what one has to do is to change the top heavy policy of uh, metropolitan and large city based uh, urbanization i mean a large part of our uh, funds actually go to uh, this uh, uh, you know for for building infrastructure and uh, transport in these metropolitan and large uh, cities therefore what is required is to uh, you know direct these funds to the small cities for infrastructural development and uh, mass transportation so that it can uh, emerge as sites of agglomeration so this is in the mid term to long term this has to be done and uh, the other thing is that we need to you know seriously think about modifying our vision of urbanization which is driven by uh, large cities and uh, you know uh, but urbanization you know the process of urbanization actually what the census data between uh, 1 to 11 actually has shown is because the census towns are actually growing and that's why your uh, you know uh, your urbanization is increasing therefore there is no need to uh, only concentrate on this uh, large cities and if you look at the desegregation of employment you would also find that it is actually uh, you know it is it is actually because of uh, the uh, you know census that that employment generation is actually more in this uh, you know in these uh, small cities rather than in the uh, in the in the uh, large cities finally uh, i think uh, uh, you know uh, the the things that one can uh, bank upon is basically that these uh, uh, cities are uh, you know these uh, small cities are also uh, you know areas where you would find cheap labor and land therefore this is through which you can attract uh, you know uh, investment in these uh, places but on the other hand we have to be careful that this does not uh, lead to lowering of the in environmental standards in these uh, in these uh, cities so i shall stop there uh, thank you very much for your patience and maybe we can take up questions uh, thanks a lot for the enlightening session sir so the participants have been sending in questions to the chat section so the first question is do we need a proper employment policy for street sellers to solve the urban economy problems uh yes i mean uh, first thing which is necessary is that of where can i see the questions or will you so tell it's me in the that? chat section so it's in the common chat section towards the bottom most window so or can i send you the questions personally to oh, but i i think i have so can you see them now no i think i have lost the video or what so we can see the screen but not you right now post uh, disabled necessary is that of registration okay so registration of this uh, i think your question was on uh, street vendors right no yes so yeah. we need a proper employment policy for street sellers to solve the urban economy problems that was the question please yeah i mean yes if street vendors would be self employed right so proper proper employment policy in the sense that if 
you want if if you want them that their rights are being protected and so on in that case the way to go basically is that uh, you know that you have to provide them registration otherwise what happens is that they are simply exploited uh, they, they are simply exploited and uh, and and with proper registration they can have uh, you know that they are the ability to claim as a part of the workforce that would actually come so, so therefore i think it, it's very necessary that the way to go in terms of specifics of policy is to to you know provide with the registration part which most you know, many of them do not have i think there was a report by uh, you know this uh, national commission on on, on this uh, street vendors report which also recommended that a uh, major problem faced by them is that they do not have registration so this is the way i think to do okay so 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 the next question is if india had a program of universal basic income in place would the current effects have been less severe uh i don't know in the following way is that a current uh, universal basic income would actually uh, help in the form of cash transfer but it is not going to help you in terms of you know uh, the uh, food part in the sense that you know that i think it's important if, so it depends upon the cash transfer actually depends up or, or or the universal basic income depends upon what is the amount that you are giving in terms of universal basic income so for example you have jandhan but in jandhan what you pay is 500 that's meaningless so therefore what it depends upon the magnitude of uh, basic income that one agrees upon the other thing is that what the government is trying to uh, do is basically to you know that other uh, schemes the other schemes they will be withdrawn so if it is it's an either or it's not an add on so if it's not an add on in that case you know uh, cash transfers has its or its uh, you know own problems and so on so so therefore I, you know uh, i am not very uh, sure is that the universal basic income would have taken care of uh, all the problems in okay. in so far as these are all these are substitutes okay sir so sir the next question is do we need a national policy for informal workers especially the urban informal workers which would be a safety net for them sorry what? hello sir i think they yeah yeah i hello he, yes sir yeah can you just repeat the question i think yes sir yes sir yeah. do we need a national policy for informal workers especially the urban informal workers which would act as a safety net for them yeah i so i spoke about that i i was talking about the you know uh, this you know uh, basic the, income no 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 i i i was talking about that this uh, you know that the employment guarantee scheme that you have for the rural areas you have to extend mm -hmm. it for the urban areas urban areas so that that's the okay so the next question is what are the chances of migrant workers who have been working in urban areas getting back to their villages for agricultural wage works post covid yeah so this is a important thing i i think the real challenge that uh the government will face is that how to bring them back because the kind of treatment that they got from uh, you know this time it, it, i mean i mean there are media reports you can see for yourself they are saying that we are i mean what may come we are not going to uh come back to this uh 
large cities because they have treated us so shabby. I mean, it's just, just cruel. Okay. So, uh, so, so chances of that they, and, and in fact, in fact, I was also reading is that uh, government uh, committee actually has recommended that uh, that they would be enrolled to Ayushman Bharat and that would be uh, what what should I say that would be a strategy through which they are thinking of bringing back these people to the urban areas yes. now uh, you see in 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 the mid term they might come back because if the if the push factor is i mean if if, if your agriculture i mean you can see that from 2004 onwards people are leaving agriculture there is a reason for that is that you can't meet subsistence in agriculture so if you can't meet subsistence for a long time probably you are going to come back the question is that as a society are we going to only uh, you know, allow this to happen and only wait for the push factor for them to come back or should we take, uh, you know, policies such that it, it's, it, that, that, uh, you know, that, uh, I mean, more human policies to those who actually come and work in the cities. So that's a question of, uh, you know, policy which can, can't be predicted at this stage. So the next question is, uh, the UP government has relaxed almost all the labor laws for three years from now. What would its implication be? Well, in an article in the Hindu group, Yes, uh, labor rights under that. free fall. Yeah. So uh, I have discussed that there, uh, you know, what, so let us see what it's saying. What it is saying is that this is going to actually bring in uh, investment, which I mean FDI, which is relocating from China. Now, There are many things here. And the other thing which it is saying is that labor rights will come later, first let us revive growth. The problem with this argument is the following, is that you are already reducing your interest rate for quite, quite some time now. Nothing is happening in terms of picking up of investment because the economy is in a downward spider. So in such a situation, private investment normally will not take up because they are uncertain with their demand. The other thing is that not only that, the you know, if if you cut down on labor costs, say say for example, they have said that minimum wages also don't have to be paid. If you do that, what is going to happen is that your you know, wages are not only costs, they have also a demand part. Now, if your, your growth of market actually falls, if the growth of market falls, in that case, what is the incentive to invest? There will be no incentive to invest. Therefore, if the growth of market depends crucially on what is the amount of wage share in the economy, because, you know, your propensity to consume out of wages is much higher than compared to that of profits. Therefore, you know, uh, that uh, with with all laws going out of the window, you do not expect that the demand is going to pick up. Neither you have the export market because all, uh, you know, all economies are facing the same problem in the world. And therefore you would, uh, you know, it's, it's a very bleak chance that almost nothing that it will, uh, you know, lead to any kind of result. For example, uh, Rajasthan actually did some labor reforms uh, two, three years back. There is no evidence that Rajasthan is doing better than compared to other states in the country. 
So, sir, the basically the recent dilution in labor losses sought to attract more private investment. But do you think that alone is enough to attract FDI? Yeah, exactly. Because you know, uh, investments not only come only looking at costs. This is a very wrong uh, perception. It also depends upon what is the infrastructure, whether you have. Uh, you know, uh, predictable power supply, whether you have skilled labor. Now, if you, I mean, there is something in economics which is called the efficiency wage theory, is that if you, you know, if you continuously keep on reducing the wage and so on, in that case, you won't get health, uh, healthy and educated workers. And, and therefore, you know if what is required also for uh, you know in a knowledge economy is that you have healthy and uh, educated workers. So if you do well with the reward loss and you you know in that case you know your productivity doesn't uh, go up it goes down. And finally, what matters to this, uh, you know, uh, to, to the farm is, of course, the difference between the productivity and the wage. Okay. Next question is, expected with respect to the employment in uh, Is there any interesting question? You see, you see. Actually, I mean, firmly you can say this if you do a survey. So what I can do is that I can simply, you know, uh, you know I can uh, say something which is uh, which is from the literature. What what it shows, what it what the literature shows is the following. Whenever you have a distress in terms of that your family income goes down, in that case, the labor force participation of women actually increases. Okay. So basically between that of, uh, I mean, this is at the, again, at the agreement. This was made by participating in big time in the world. Many, you know, many people who have then after that find out is that this was basically distress-led, uh, you know, distress-led uh, participation in the uh, labor in the labor market. Where incidentally, you also found that old people and also children joining the labor force because simply, you know, if your if your wage goes down and if you have a subsistence level of income, in that case, your wage goes down, your number of working hours have to go up. Similarly, in this case, what has to go up is the number of people participating in the, uh, in the labor market. So yes, possibilities are that if, you know, in the rural sector that this is going to increase. However, there is another possibility and this possibly will be more, uh, you know, more, uh, It's also uh, so. So basically, the they are, uh, you know what should I say? The labor market is also sex segregated. Okay, there are certain kinds of jobs which uh, female do. There are certain kinds of jobs which male do. Now, in, in a period of crisis, I'm talking about the urban area. It is possible. It is possible that. Those jobs which were earlier done data for with the survey and so on. So, so yeah. 
Okay, sir. So the last question is. And deliver a However, there is one, you know, the Social Security Court bill actually is saying is that they will be also included in uh, for Social Security and so on. Now, uh, workers and uh, then, you know, uh, uh, provide the rights of these workers and so on. And, uh, you know, it, it, it depends upon the uh, if you have uh, there are only certain kinds of jobs which can be done in isolation and these are typically low end jobs okay and there are also other problems with the uh, you know gig, gig economy and so on and for example there are also wage things so how do we regulate these things in the coming days and in so far as uh, you know that uh, these jobs can be done in isolation uh, uh, so uh, so this in, in terms of this okay sir so there's another question so higher educational trends that are usually oriented to choices abroad are bound to shift to domestic choices. Do you think this would prove detrimental for other countries that rely on Indian labor? Sorry, I don't follow the question. I, I, I could not follow your question. So the question is, abroad are bound to shift to domestic choices. Do you think this would... In the, in the short run. You mean yes, in the sir. short run? Okay. We, do you think this would prove detrimental for other countries that rely on India? I think uh, she's basically trying to ask uh, uh, how is the shift from abroad choices abroad from dom to domestic choices would affect other countries with no, regard to upon that how no, but depends upon how long. I mean, in the very short term, probably yes. But, uh, you know, those who have uh, migrated, it's not necessary that they are all going to come back. The point is that whether the flow will continue or not in the coming days. Now, the, the, that depends upon that how, uh, you know, uh, how much uh, the migration rules post-COVID are uh, relaxed or uh, it's uh, more tightened it, it will depend on that so i do not find that uh, you know that uh, choice in the mid term if it is allowed even in the mid term if it is allowed is going to actually turn back uh, uh, for domestic choices no i don't think so people will still go to oxford and other places in order to study i mean if it is allowed Yes. Okay, so, uh, so, so there are more questions unanswered. I think uh, one more question. So how would you suggest the states to deal with the uh, difference in revenue in generating revenue sources and finding enough finances without uh, borrowing? Now borrowing states. Yes, sir. Somebody has raised they, a question. They, because... they can't print money. States can't print money. They have to yes. do it. I mean, I, uh, they either have to uh, ask for grants from the center, they, or otherwise they have to borrow. Okay, sir. So thanks a lot for the enlightening session. Sir. We very happy to uh, express. You can see the video. Why can't you can't see the video? What is happening? No, but I can't see my video also. Why? So I think it might be some. Video.
difference in the window that you are possibly yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt, so but sorry, we are sharing your screen might be able to see. Just to you for the pieces of information that you shared with us. We are really, very overwhelmed and can't thank enough for joining us for the advising stage. I'm sure that a lot of us uh, can relate to the various points you reminded us with precise statistical evidence. Also, much gratitude for answering our questions patiently, sir. I would also love to thank Dr. Ma Mahalia Chatterjee for joining the, step, the first webinar in the series. We, City Speaks, is very uh, happy and at the same time very proud to have had two illuminaries through the first of our webinar series. I thank you once again, sir, for the whole City Speaks family. I would also love to thank everyone from the audience and would love to welcome to the family each of you who joined City Speaks for the first time today and would love once again thanks